Hello, I'm really honoured actually to have today's guest to discuss the ICJ ruling and what it means, its significance, what happens next, and I guess the broader context, what does this mean in terms of the world order and the level of impunity that Israel has been granted since its foundation back in 1948. Um, Muin Rabani is a, someone I've been following on social media for a while, does these brilliant, very incisive threads um, about the crisis, which I found extremely educational. He's a researcher, analyst, commentator. He's the co-editor of uh, Jadalia. Is that right? Am I pronouncing it correct? Right. Ish. You winced a bit there, I saw. So that was an, an ish pronunciation. No, no, was right on. Yeah. Um, host the Connections podcast, edits his Quick Thoughts feature, managing editor and associate editor of the Journal of Peace, Building and Development. Lots of hats, essentially. Uh, contributing editor of Middle East Report. Um, and... Uh, he's previously served as principal pol pol political affairs officer and uh, with the office for the UN special envoy to Syria. I mean, just lots of huge expertise. So we're very glad to have you. Um, well, you, with you first, on. well it's, it's a big honor to have you. And as I've said, I, I, I really hope after this, people follow you on social media and, and they will see soon see quickly what, what I mean. Thank you. In terms of the ICJ ruling, then, I mean, it's, it's interesting today, um, the Biden administration engaging, and I would just say, will for, well, I mean, it's, it is misinformation. And so a spokesperson saying, well, Israel wasn't found guilty of genocide by the ICJ. Just So you would expect, just interested in that context, the significance of the ICJ ruling, given the yes. misinformation being peddled. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that um, we could count these U.S. statements as misinformation. They correctly stated um, that the International Court of Justice has not found Israel uh, guilty of genocide. What they left out is that the ICJ has not yet ruled on um, whether Israel has or has not committed genocide. So it's kind of, you know, saying um, that someone on trial for murder uh, has not been found guilty on the first day of the trial. Um, more generally, I think what happened yesterday in The Hague at the International Court of Justice is of massive and historic significance. Many people looked at this issue um, through the narrow lens, if you will, about whether or not the International Court of Justice is going to order an immediate ceasefire. That's not what this case was about. And I think we shouldn't confuse the ICJ with the UN Security Council which is a kind of body that usually takes these kinds of um, decisions. The ICJ is a court. The ICJ issues legal rulings that have profound moral and political um, significance or can have um, uh, that significance. It did it in the case of Namibia. Um, it did it in the case of Western Sahara. It did it um, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, in uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, last year, an ongoing case. Um, and it did it in 2004 with respect to um, uh, Israel's apartheid wall in the West Bank. The real issue here is that South Africa has accused Israel of perpetrating genocide. And at this stage of the proceedings, the ICJ was making one decision and one decision alone, and that is whether or not South Africa presented a plausible case that Israel is engaging in genocide. In other words, whether this case should be thrown out and ended or whether South Africa's arguments were sufficiently compelling and Israel's rebuttals and denials sufficiently unconvincing that the case could move forward. And by an overwhelming majority, the judges of the ICJ ruled that South Africa had indeed um, uh, put forward a plausible case. And we're now going to have the equivalent of a full trial, something that can last uh, many years. This, in my view, is history with a capital H. It really changes everything because um, it's not just that a state is being accused of genocide. It is that Israel is being accused of genocide. Now, Israel presents itself um, as the Jewish state. Um, it has, since its establishment, enveloped itself in a cloak of impunity, in large part um, in the context of, uh, of the Nazi Holocaust against uh, the Jews of Europe, and has used 
that history as a shield to insulate itself um, from accusations of criminal wrongdoing vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people in a sense that all ended yesterday. I think from this moment forward in the public consciousness, Israel will be seen not just in the context of compensation for the Holocaust or reparations for the Holocaust, which is how Israel likes to be seen and has presented itself, but as a state that will forever be associated with perpetrating um, uh, genocide. And, and given that international public opinion has for Israel from its very inception been an asset of strategic significance, it's a huge, very big deal. I'd, I'd like just to say a few words about um, uh, the absence of a ceasefire order as well. Of course, South Africa did request the court um, to order a ceasefire, and the court didn't. Of course, it would have been um, icing on the cake if the court had done so. But I think if we look at the relevant precedents um, of this court, the genocide cases in Bosnia in the 1990s and Myanmar um, in 2019, in those cases, the court also didn't um, issue a ceasefire order. Perhaps more to the point, South Africa didn't ask the court to issue a judgment on the legality of um, Israeli military operations in the Gaza Strip. So one could argue there was no reason for the judges to wade into this hornet's nest and offer an opinion on a conflict that they were not asked um, uh, to judge. And then many people say, yes, but the court did issue a ceasefire order in the case of uh, Ukraine versus Russia last year. That's true, but that was a very different case. Ukraine was not accusing Russia of genocide. Ukraine was defending itself against um, what it informed the court were false Russian accusations of genocide leveled against Ukraine and being used by Russia as a justification for the Russian um, military operations in Ukraine. And it was on that very different basis that the court ordered a ceasefire in Ukraine. I mean, that's a critical point, isn't it? Because in that particular case, the, the, the court was saying the pretext given for this invasion, which is that Ukraine is committing genocide in the Donbass, is false. And therefore, the basis for military operations is false. And therefore, they must, they yes. must go ahead. So that, that's yeah. what's caused confusion. I mean, yes. I suppose and, and, the point is... If I may, I mean, uh, some people have suggested that, that South Africa could have perhaps should have put forward a similar argument here in the sense that Israeli officials and spokespeople since October 7th, the Hamas attacks in Israel, have repeatedly um, uh, labeled these attacks as acts of genocide and have used that to mobilize uh, support and justification for their genocidal onslaught on the Gaza Strip. Um, perhaps um, they could have, but my sense is that the South African legal team wanted to focus uh, very directly and exclusively on their main accusation and didn't want to be seen to be going on a fishing expedition and throwing in every strand of uh, spaghetti uh, available at the wall to see what sticks. I mean, in, in terms of the provisional orders, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, the key point I suppose many would make is what the court has ordered Israel to do isn't compatible with the military operations, if we're caught, I mean, it's a euphemistic term for what Israel is doing, yes. but it's, it's, they're not compatible, are they? Yes, and, and that's by implication because the court did not directly and explicitly order Israel to halt its uh, military operations. It did order it not to take any actions um, that, that violate the various provisions of, of the Genocide Convention to ensure uh, sufficient delivery of humanitarian aid and so on. And I'm, I'm not trying to belittle any of these um, issues. They are, of course, crucially important, particularly to those in the Gaza Strip directly affected. But I think it's important to bear in mind the International Court of Justice has no power to enforce its orders and rulings. So, in, And the only way their rulings can be enforced is if the UN Security Council which of course has the United States as a veto-wielding permanent member, 
issue such a resolution. And in this case, that's simply not going to happen. So I think the focus on what the court did and did not order, was it this measure or was it that measure, kind of misses um, uh, the key issue, which is a more political, moral, uh, legal issue, which is a crucial point about whether the world Supreme Court has found that there is a plausible case to be made that Israel is engaging in genocide. Because bear in mind, as, as we were discussing earlier, at this stage, the court is not offering a judgment on whether Israel is or is not, in fact, committing genocide, but whether there should be a full and proper hearing on this issue. And that they overwhelmingly decided that this should indeed be the case is, I think, of historic significance. One of the things I I was thinking over when the the judge, on behalf, obviously, of the the court was uh, the, sorry, the president of the ICJ, uh, the, the the judge went through the genocidal statements made by Israeli politicians and leaders, and I felt at that point actually that this was such a damning indictment for the Western media, which I'm part of, because all the way from the very beginning, there has been no subtlety. I mean, I, I interviewed Raz Gal, the Israeli-American professor, associate professor of genocide and Holocaust studies. He said it's actually very rare for intent to be so crudely put, because often what happens is, for example, genocides happen, you get official denials. They might even claim humanitarian intentions. Um, and you, you basically, you know, have to maybe go, there's some classified documents somewhere you might be able to get hold of it for a future war crimes judgment. They just said it. And one example was um, Yo Galant, the Israeli defense minister, on the eve of the, of, of the ground invasion, saying, I've released all the straits from soldiers. Now, the reason I bring this up is the Western media coverage has been either just cheering on Israel, but generally presenting this as a counterinsurgency program with a side debate about whether it's proportional or there's been some excess. Yes. Those statements by Israeli leaders and officials have not shaped the coverage of this at all. They've, all, in fact, largely been ignored. I, I Googled that Yov Galant statement because you keep getting IDF soldiers committing war crimes and po posting them on TikTok. And people are like, what's happened? Is discipline broken down? Without mm. note, noting that... You, the defense minister has removed all restrictions on soldiers. So I'm just interested in that. You know, the court spoke and delivered. I thought that was very powerful. And that's a damning indictment of how this had been covered and, and shaped by media coverage. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think you raise an absolutely crucial point. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not either a scholar of um, uh, genocide nor a specialist in international law. Um, but those who are consistently point out that what sets genocide apart from other um, war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity is the element of intent. In other words, it's you are um, uh, found innocent or guilty, not only on the basis of what you've actually done, because that's insufficient, you also have to prove why it was done. In, in this case, as the South African uh, legal team in The Hague brilliantly demonstrated, there is just an avalanche of, of statements uh, that demonstrate intent. And just as importantly, they were able to draw a real connection between the statements of leaders, of decision makers, of opinion formers, and so on, on the one hand, and the actions of Israel's soldiers um, uh, in the field on the other. And why is this so important? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with um, the tired refrain of Holocaust deniers who always say, well, you know, if there was a Holocaust in Europe, where's the memo Hitler wrote to Himmler um, telling him explicitly um, uh, to exterminate um, uh, the Jews of Europe? oh, there isn't such a memo, well, then there wasn't a Holocaust. You know, these kinds of silly and sordid arguments, because as you point out, um, uh, usually, you know, people who engage in these kinds of crimes try to make an effort to cover their tracks, and the crime is th then has to be proven on the basis of inferring intent from the actual actions of the perpetrator here. We have what, what many um, uh, genocide scholars and international legal specialists have pointed out, 
is, is a very unusual, if not unique case, in the sense that intent has been broadcast loudly and clearly um, uh, from the very get-go. And, and, as, and as you point out, in, in much of the mainstream Western media, um, the approach has been to kind of ig ignore much of that, um, to look at the Israeli military um, by, by one that is governed by discipline, um, by uh, um, regulations, by international law, you know, this old tired canard of uh, the most moral army in the world that fights mm -hmm. according to purity of arms. And then to look at um, the kinds of horrors and atrocities we've been, we've been seeing in the Gaza Strip as um, a few rotten apples or as a breakdown of, um, of military order and discipline and so on, rather than as the implementation of an official policy. What do you think about the near unanimity? Um, given, I mean, the Ugandan judge, I think lots of people were slightly perturbed by her, but by the fact she even voted against, for example, providing humanitarian aid, but she said basically she just mm. didn't think the court had any authority whatsoever um, on such a conflict. But the fact before this, a lot of people thought, well, the US judge will clearly flat side with Israel. She was part of the US State Department. She's actually part of the yeah. US legal establishment. She was a people thought real politique would intrude. But the fact that you had, I mean, even the Israeli ad hoc judge voted on, for example, impunity. What do you yes. what do you make of that? That is so overwhelming. Well, I think, you know, ultimately when people look back on 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 this uh ruling, this order from yesterday, they're going to look at the result and mm -hmm. and um you know which judge voted how and <coughs> which mm -hmm. and what the majority was is I think going to probably disappear into the history books um fairly soon. But nevertheless, I, I do think it's an important issue. Um, first of all, as you uh, as you mentioned, um, the majority was overwhelming. All the votes yep. were either 16 to 1 or 16 to 2. Secondly, personally, I think it's significant that the president of the ICJ yesterday was an American, and not only an American, um, uh, but an American um, uh, judge who made her career as a lawyer in the American government who held senior yeah. positions in the State Department where kind of Israeli impunity is baked into the um, uh, professional code, if you will. You know, of, of course, ICJ um, judges, they're nominated by their governments, but, but they don't serve as government officials. In other words, they don't take instructions um, uh, from their capitals the way an ambassador, for example, uh, might. Um, but nevertheless, I think to have this verdict delivered in American English by an American judge um, yeah. uh, with her professional background is is not something um, uh, I would uh, I would underestimate. Secondly, regarding the um, uh, Ugandan judge, I I read her dissenting opinion, and and several things stood out. Um, uh, first of all, she said that this is a um, political and historical dispute between Israel and the Palestinian people that should not be resolved in a court of law, but, she, but should be resolved through um, negotiations or mm -hmm. through a political settlement. Well, whatever one may think about the prospects of um, resolving um, this through a political settlement, the fact of the matter is that the reason this case um, came to the ICJ is for a very specific legal reason, namely um, a document that is the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So there's, this is very clearly a legal dispute. Secondly, um, the dispute before the ICJ was not between Israel and the Palestinians. It was between South Africa and Israel, and it was bought on the basis of a specific legal dispute arising from the fact that both of these states are signatories to that convention. Um, but the, um, the dissenting opinion that I actually found the most interesting was out of the German judge. Um, mm -hmm. And this gets back a little to our previous discussion about intent. If you read his, um, if you read his own opinion, he makes clear um, that he wasn't overwhelmingly impressed by the case presented by South Africa. 
and that under different circumstances, he may have voted um, uh, differently. But then he concludes by saying that what made, made it impossible for me to do anything other than vote for the court's um, provisional measures is the question of intent and the repeated statements made by Israeli leaders demonstrating mm -hmm. that intent. And that, in effect, tied his hands and left him with no choice but to do something he was otherwise disinclined um, uh, to do. As far as the um, as far as the Israeli um, ad hoc judge uh, is concerned, and here I should point out the reason that he is um, sitting on this court in a in a um, ad hoc capacity is because states that have cases um, uh, before the court that do not already have sitting judges on the court are permitted to nominate. Um, uh, judges to serve on the court for that specific case, at least as far as the genocide convention is concerned. You know, Aharon Barak is perhaps Israel's most celebrated um, uh, legal scholar and judge. He is also a very uh, notorious individual because he has been absolutely crucial to the legalization of Israel's many policies um, in mm -hmm. the West Bank that amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity, issues such as um, uh, the, the establishment and expansion of illegal settlements, um, deportation, mm -hmm. torture, house demolitions, and all the rest of it. And in fact, in 2004, when he was uh, president of Israel's Supreme Court, he overturned the ICJ's advisory opinion on the West Bank wall. Um, and, you know, with, with the ruling that he understands the issue much better than the International Court of Justice does, and so therefore Israel is free to ignore that uh, right. opinion. Oh, I'm curious, I don't know if the ICJ judges um, have dinner together, but it would have been very interesting to be a fly on the wall <laughs> those events yeah. and, and and see what, uh, what these people uh, discussed. And, you know, you read his dissenting opinion, and the first part of it, is um, he recounts his um, uh, his own uh, personal history, and I believe it was Latvia or Lithuania um, uh, during the Nazi Holocaust and how he managed uh, to, to survive. Well, this may be um, moving testimony, but it is absolutely irrelevant because this case is, is, is not about the Nazis, it's about the state of Israel. And one, mm -hmm. one other thing that distinguishes the crime of genocide is that there can be absolutely no contextual or historical or mm -hmm. circumstantial justification. It's not like the taking of a human life where you can justify it by saying you acted in self-defense against an imminent threat of, um, uh, of being killed yourself. If you're guilty of genocide, there is no excuse or justification for it, full stop. And and you know Aharon Barak knows this, but he nevertheless um, did that, and then entered into another long song and dance, um, basically trying to demonstrate um, once again this old canard of Israel being the most moral army in the world. Every soldier carries, um, uh, by his orders, international law texts in their backpack, you know, along with their sniper rifles and and, and high explosives and all the rest of it. I presume. So, it, you know, it, it makes for rather amusing uh, reading for those who live in the 21st century. Yeah, that's such a key point. There's that, I mean, that South Africa's case wasn't there. There was never any basis or justification or provocation for genocide. And there's lots of cases throughout history where, I mean, in Rwanda in 1990, the Rwandan uh, Popular Front invaded, committed terrible atrocities. That didn't justify, clearly, the Rwandan genocide. Similarly, Bosnian Serb civilians, there are huge atrocities committed against Bosnia and civilians. That doesn't justify the crime of genocide. Um, in terms of what's happened now, it's striking that the uh, Shin Bet, Israel's intelligence agency, has suddenly, just at this particular opportune moment, said they found evidence of a few members of the UNRWA, that's the United Nations Agency, for those who don't know, which is in charge of Palestinian, uh, looking after Palestinian refugees, founded in the aftermath of, of the Nakba, I think 1949 it was founded, um, and they're claiming, you know, and now Britain and the US are cutting off uh, funding. Um, so just, I mean, that's where the media coverage is now focusing. It's not about the ICJ, yeah. the United Nations, complicity, um, and it's, it's, it's 
it's not Israel. It's therefore Israel's critics are on the defensive. That's how it's been made to be spun. Yes. What do you make of the significance of this, of the nature of the attack, and actually what it means? Because UNRWA is is it saves lives. I mean, without UNRWA in the current catastrophe, what? So what do you make of all of this? Well, there's there's several strands to this story. Um, one of them is the long-standing and ongoing um, Israeli attack against UNRWA. Um, and its um, constant campaign to delegitimize uh, UNRWA and to basically seek to prevent what is a United Nations humanitarian agency as somehow being a political agent operating um, on, on behalf uh, of the Palestinians. And, and this is a campaign that has also been, um, to a very large extent, endorsed by Israel's Western sponsors in the United States and, and, and uh, in Europe. You know, there's UNRWA is constantly under investigation, usually for the same thing, you know, school textbooks and, and all these other silly things. And every time nothing comes up, well, that's because we need another investigation uh, ad infinitum. So that's one element of the background. The other element of the background is the issue we've been discussing, the International Court of Justice um, uh, provisional ruling um of uh of yesterday or interim ruling and and um my understanding is that israel timed the release of a statement accusing i believe 12 unwa staff of having been directly and personally involved in the palestinian attacks on israel of october 7th timed the release to coincide with the ICJ um, uh, session mm -hmm. yesterday um, in an effort to uh, divert um, uh, attention from it. Um, UNRWA got wind of this and thought that it would, and the UNRWA leadership seems to have believed that the best way to engage in damage control would be to put out a very strong statement um, uh, immediately firing these accused individuals, um, uh, repeating um, on multiple multiple times in that statement how um, uh, fiercely opposed UNRWA is uh, to terrorism, um, and announcing a full investigation by the UN's internal investigative agency. The problem is that UNRWA, UNRWA I think, made several missteps. The way that they responded to these accusations can be read as somehow validating them. That's mm -hmm. number one. Secondly, I think UNRWA's motivation was to demonstrate to um, its uh, key funders in the West that it is taking these accusations very seriously. Whereas what in fact happened is that um, first the United States and today the United Kingdom um, of course, embrace the Israeli accusations like they embrace um, Israeli propaganda um, whenever that's the case. And then I think also took UNRWA's initial admission of guilt, um, as you will, or at least considered it as such, to suspend their funding to the agency. So I think um, it was quite an own goal uh, by the UNRWA leadership that could have easily been avoided. Um, you know, UNRWA could have pointed out very easily um, that they take these accusations very seriously, that they're engaging in a full and comprehensive um, independent investigation of these accusations, um, that the individuals named are suspended perhaps um, uh, until uh, the conclusion of proceedings. But, you know, the way they were um, uh, summarily fired and so on, I think doesn't look good at all. Um, and of course, these individuals have the right to due process. And what UNRWA could have then done is also point out that more UNRWA, uh, that more UN staff have been killed in the Gaza Strip since October 7th than in any other conflict during the history um, of the UN. And perhaps pointed out um, that all of these um, uh, staff who have been killed since October 7th are in fact UNRWA staff. But I think there's an issue here. You know, um, UNRWA staff are overwhelmingly Palestinians, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, teachers, uh, doctors, and so on. And, and I guess in the, 
you know, in the UN's um, uh, ranking of, of value of employees, um, these people perhaps um, count for a little less um, than if you're talking about uh, uh, Europeans or, or North Americans uh, or others. And UNRWA could have also, perhaps it would have been difficult for it to point out directly, but apparently these Israeli accusations are based on um, uh, confessions extracted under interrogation in Israeli prisons. Well, there have been so many previous cases where the Israelis, you know, um, with American and, and European backing have made these types of uh, allegations that have then been demonstrated to have been completely unfounded war propaganda. And UNRWA could have found a way um, to make sure that journalists covering this story are also aware of that. And secondly, UNRWA, or finally, UNRWA could have also pointed out how many employees it has. Um, uh, you know, this isn't um, 12 out of 20 employees who are being accused uh, by Israel. This is 12 out of many, many thousands. So yeah. I think UNRWA spectacularly uh, mishandled uh, this issue. And, and as far as the accusations themselves are concerned, you know, torture is legitimate in the state of Israel. These um, uh, people are being accused on the basis, apparently, of um, confessions extracted under interrogation um, uh, in Israeli prisons. That alone, I think, should raise question marks pending further investigation. That's such a key point. 13,000 Palestinian UNRWA staffers uh, working yeah. in Gaza. Um, so we're talking about a handful. I mean, it'd be like the, the government's suddenly suspending funding for the National Health Service because some of its employees have been engaged in criminal activity um i mean i was gonna say I mean, there's not even a parallel there because we're not even talking about criminal activity on the job here i mean it's not that surprising if, if there's a a number of palestinians involved in that particular attack that's some well exactly and if, if i can interrupt you i mean you know unwa like um other un and, and aid agencies of course um does have an obligation um uh for uh neutrality and, and needless to say its staff um uh can't be uh involved in um, armed activities on behalf of uh, resistance uh, movements. But, you know, as you point out, even if you assume um, that these accusations are um, uh, legitimate and, and are going to be substantiated, okay, you know, how many um, uh, UK civil servants have been guilty of domestic abuse, perhaps even guilty of murder? As you say, that doesn't impugn the apparatus um, uh, as a whole. And, and the other thing I, I would like to add is that as a result of what happened yesterday, um, the identification or the, continu the continuum between the policies of the Donald Trump administration towards the Palestinians and of the Biden administration is now complete. It has now become indistinguishable because as you may remember, during the Trump administration, um, the United States um, recognized uh, the illegal Israeli annexation of, uh, of East Jerusalem. It recognized um, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel in violation of international law, including UN Security Council resolutions that the United States had not opposed, um, in violation of, that, of a different UN Security Council resolution that relocated its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It shut down um, uh, both the uh, U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem, which served primarily Palestinians, and ordered the closure of the PLO mission in the United States in Washington, D.C., um, recognized Israel's annexation of the um, occupied and illegally annexed Syrian Golan Heights, and it launched a furious campaign against Palestinian refugees um, the focus of which was to seek to defund and abolish UNRWA. When Biden came into um, uh, office, they left all those policies and decisions in place. The only significant change was that um, Biden restored U.S. funding to UNRWA. That is now suspended again. So Trump and Biden policies towards the Palestinians have now become literally indistinguishable. I think it's such a key point that it, as well, the, the continuity, not just in terms of how Biden and the like have portrayed themselves as custodians of this liberal international order, 
uh, compared to Donald Trump, but they're actually now undermining international institutions, including the United Nations itself, in a way that's not actually distinguishable with yes. uh, the policies of Trump. But just finally, just to circle back to where we began, really, and it's that point you made about history with a capital H. Um, and I just want, in terms of taking that long view, I mean, I keep mentioning, for example, Raz Sigal, who, who uh, the, the Israeli-American um, Associate Professor of Genocide and Holocaust Studies, he, he made the exact point about you, that you made about how Israel was granted this impunity um, after World War II. And I'm just wondering, in terms of, you know, lots of things are happening, because I think if you look at the US, younger generations are far more pro-Palestinian than they've ever been. There's a, a huge shift currently taking place there. And actually, if you see Biden's polling numbers amongst younger Americans, they're catastrophic, and Palestine has definitely fed into that. Um, so you've got in the, in the, the you know, the, uh, the custodian of his, the, the, the protector of Israel, its own electorate is shifting away from Israel. We've seen here the global south basically stage a revolt and force the top court on earth to strip away Israeli impunity. I mean, do you think generally, actually, if you were looking at the long term, if you were at the top of the Israeli state, you actually might be a bit worried about where things are heading. I'd, I'd be very worried. Um, and and for a number of reasons. One is the issues that we've been discussing today, that Israel is now um, continues to be associated with genocide, as it always has been since the moment of its establishment. Um, I won't get into the details, but I think um, that doesn't really apply because you know Zionism emerged in the late nineteenth century, decades uh, before the yeah. Nazis um, came to power. But anyway, so Israel has since its inception, particularly in, in, in the Western mind, been associated with genocide, of course, as a victim of genocide. Um, that has now completely um, uh, changed. Um, Israel is now primarily associated in the public consciousness as a perpetrator um, mm -hmm. rather than as a victim of, of genocide. And, and again, given um, the strategic significance of public support um, uh, for Israel, you know, it's South Africa basically couldn't care less um, what anyone uh, thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Russia hasn't been seeking um, widespread public uh, uh, support for its actions in Ukraine and so on. So this is a huge deal. Um, secondly, if we look specifically at the United States, in my view, Israel's most important um, uh, strategic asset over um, uh, the decades has, has not been so much, you know, the weapons and vetoes and all, all the other things um, that Washington has been delivering to Israel, but the solid bipartisan U.S. political support that make mm -hmm. this uh, possible. Um, uh, and that is now also beginning to fray. It's beginning mm -hmm. to fray in part because of um, the issues um, uh, that you mentioned, you know, Older generations, I think, were were um, more prone to look at Israel, see a Jewish state, and think Nazis. Um, younger generations, I think, are more prone to uh, look at Israel and see uh, apartheid, and now um, uh, genocide as well. But I think the key issue here is that Israel has had it too good for too long to the extent that it didn't really have to try very hard anymore and began making, I think, some very significant strategic mistakes. For example, the way Netanyahu inserted himself into the U.S. domestic debate about the Iranian nuclear agreement mm -hmm. in 2015 and actually went there as a tool of the Republican Party um, to address uh, the U.S. Congress to um, oppose the nuclear agreement, which was, of course, a pet project of the Obama administration. The way that um, uh, Israel has sought to make itself a partisan issue in the United States as kind of, um, uh, you know, a key project of the evangelical um, uh, Christian movement, of the MAGA types, of, of right-wing Republicans, uh, and so on. And you see this in Europe as well where Israel is forming ever closer alliances with far-right um, uh, radicals mm -hmm. at the expense of the support it used to, much more broad support it used to enjoy among Christian democratic and social democratic and, and, and liberal and conservative elites. So that, I think, you know, it's going to take time 
uh, to play out and to be translated into different policies. But this is, I think, of absolutely crucial uh, uh, significance that's not going to end well for Israel. Raymond, it's been such an honor. Um, as Honors all mine. See, uh, hugely incisive and in-depth look at such a range of issues. And it's been very educational for me. And I, I think it will be extremely educational for everyone who has watched or listened. So do make sure you follow. I'll, Mirin Rabani, I'll, I'll, I'll put his social media info in the video description. Uh, do like this video and subscribe and share the video. Uh, make sure everyone hears this, his wisdom as much as possible. But Mirin, it's been a big honor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Owen. It was a real pleasure being on your program.